Okay. So, uh, well, I'm going to do something that is uh, in between the two previous speakers, that is uh, neither infinitely slow nor infinitely uh, fast. <coughs> so this is, uh, uh, since this is an exactly solvable uh, session, let me be bold and pose an exactly solvable question. So consider the non-stationary Schrodinger equation where H of T is some interesting interacting many body or a matrix Hamiltonian that explicitly depends on time. And the question is, under what conditions on H of T is a non-stationary Schrodinger equation exactly solvable? So to uh, understand this question better, let's start with uh, uh, usual time-independent integrability. Take, for example, the one-dimensional Hubbard model, which is a famous exactly solvable model. So it is a tight binding model plus on-site interaction with strands U. Or equivalently, you can think uh, about any other uh, solvable model that has a parameter, such as the XXZ model or Leibniz model. So uh, there is an exact solution of the stationary Schrodinger equation by that hands up that gives you the eigenstates and eigenenergies. And there is an infinite sequence of parameter dependent integrals of motion, HK, that commute with the Hamiltonian and among themselves. In the case of the Hubbard model, they are polynomial in U. So now, suppose we make U uh, time dependent, a function of time. Uh, in general, this uh, completely destroys the uh, integrability. So, for example, uh, the commuting partners are no longer integrals of motion. So, the, uh, while the commutator is not affected and vanishes, this uh, partial time derivative doesn't because HK depends on U and U depends on time. Uh, moreover, the knowledge of uh, the uh, spectrum eigenstates and uh, eigenvalues is uh, basically uh, useless unless you change u infinitely slowly or infinitely uh, fast like in a, a quantum quench. So uh, while I can write my time dependent state in terms of this uh, uh, eigenstates which now have the meaning of instantaneous or adiabatic eigenstates the problem is that this coefficient cn uh, depend on time. So this is just a rewrite of the uh, Schrodinger equation in uh, some basis. And the physical reason uh, behind this uh, is uh, uh, Landau is in a tunneling between adiabatic eigenstates, uh, which, can, uh, and which is generally highly uh, non-trivial. So, in this context, the question is, uh, can we make parameters of an integrable model time dependent without breaking integrability? In other words, can we have integrable Landau's in a dynamics? And for those in the audience who are not expert in uh, integrability, uh, let me mention that this is something that is almost unheard of. And uh, not to keep you hanging, let me uh, give you uh, the answer at this uh, point already that uh, yes, we can, at least for some uh, integrable models. And now I will show you two uh, interesting uh, examples that later I will show are uh, uh, indeed uh, exactly solvable. So uh, my first example is uh, the famous uh, BCS Hamiltonian. Uh, so this is, uh, these are fermions in some arbitrary single particle potential with uh, energy levels epsilon k plus pairing interactions between fermions. In this form, the Hamiltonian was written by Anderson in uh, 1958. And if we uh, take zero single particle potential, then we'll get uh, the BCS Hamiltonian in terms of momentum states in its uh, original form. So like for the Hubbard model, there is an exact solution for the spectrum and there are non-trivial G-dependent commuting partners. Now let's make a G a function of time. As we said, in general, this breaks integrability, but we'll see that uh, there are certain special choices of uh, time dependence when the problem remains integrable. And one such choice is uh, 
uh, inverse function of time proportional to one over t. And for this case, I'll show you an exact solution for psi of t, and I will also show you an explicit answer for the fermion distribution function uh, at t going to plus infinity when we start from the ground state at t uh, equals to uh, t, uh, t zero. So essentially, initially, we have an infinite superconducting coupling, and we turn it off as one over t. Now, uh, my second example is an important uh, problem in the physics of uh, 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 BCS-BEC condensates of ultra-cold fermions. So in these systems, uh, the strength of interaction can be controlled by magnetic field. So the plot here shows the scattering uh, uh, lens, S-wave scattering lens, as a function of magnetic field. So on the right side of the Feshbach resonance, you have fermions with attractive interactions, and on the left side, they bind into bosonic molecules that repel each other. So this uh, physics is captured by this uh, fermion boson Hamiltonian that has uh, the fermions, the uh, bosons in a mode that is uh, condensing, and the fermion boson interaction that converts a pair of fermions into a boson. If this uh, parameter gamma, uh, dimensionless resonance width, is much less than one, then this model is known to be uh, quantitatively accurate throughout the BCS-BEC crossover. Otherwise, it's accurate for a large gamma uh, sufficiently far from uh, the resonance. And similar to the BCS model, uh, this is a better and solvable model with G-dependent uh, commuting partners. Now, uh, let's examine its ground state in two limits. When omega naught goes to plus infinity, having a single boson costs infinite energy. Uh, so the, in the ground state, there are no uh, bosons, and this is, uh, this is just a, a Fermi gas uh, with Fermi Dirac uh, distribution. In the opposite limit, when omega naught goes to minus infinity, there are no atoms in the ground state, and everything condenses into a single mode. So there are no uh, atoms, and the number of bosons is uh, maximum. Uh, however, uh, what you can do in experiment, you can change uh, uh, this omega naught uh, only with some finite uh, rate uh, nu. So let's say omega naught is minus nu t. Then at t minus infinity, we uh, begin in the ground state, uh, which is the Fermi gas. And so uh, now at t plus infinity, because of the finite rate, we are not going to end up uh, in the ground state. We are going to end up with some number of fermions, and the question is, what is the distribution? And the question is, how many of them condensed into this uh, bosonic mode? So now uh, notice two things. First of all, that you know, as we, uh, as I mentioned, this is an exactly solvable model, better than that solvable model. And we are making one of the parameters omega naught a function of time. So this is an example like uh, before. And secondly, in this case, the Hamiltonian is going to be linear in time. So this is an example of what is known uh, as a multi-level landau a problem. So in this problem, we have a Hamiltonian that is uh, linear in time, a plus bt, where a and b are some uh, uh, time-independent end by end Hermitian matrices. So uh, uh, let's say we are given the initial state at minus infinity. Then the state uh, at plus infinity, because equations of motion are linear, is going to be some matrix times the initial state. So this matrix is known as a scattering matrix, and the question is, uh, the problem is to find it. And in particular, transition probabilities from state i at minus infinity to state k at plus infinity are modulus square of elements of this uh, scattering matrix. Uh, so it is customary to work in a basis where b is diagonal, and this is known as a diabetic basis. So uh, for n equal 2, uh, this problem was solved independently by Landau, Zinner, and Majorana, Majorana and Stuckelberg in 1932 and published in four uh, different journals. So you can so show that without loss of generality, you can bring any uh, two by two problem uh, into this form. Then there is a solution 
for of the non-stationary Schrodinger uh, in terms of parabolic cylinder function, while the transition probabilities are given by some elementary functions of g and lambda, and here in particular is the probability to remain in the ground state, the uh, survival probability. It's given by the famous landau zina formula, uh, so as a function of this interaction, g and the rate lambda, and you see that it goes to one as lambda goes to uh, zero, indicating adiabaticity. Now, already for three states, uh, this problem has no general solution. So for n greater than two, solution, uh, exact solution is known only in uh, certain special cases. So, so my question in this context is under what conditions on A and B is the multi-level Landau's in a problem exactly solvable? And what is the solution? So solvable in this context I will define as if you can find the transition probabilities as elementary functions of matrix elements of A and B. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a bottom-up approach, meaning that I will list all solvable examples that uh, I know, and then I'm going to ask what do they have in common, and try to generalize from there. So, first of all, there are uh, so-called reducible multi-level Landau's in a problems, and uh, one example is a driven quantum Ising model where we take the transverse field to be a linear function of time. So after Jordan Wigner followed by Fourier, the Hamiltonian breaks up into a sum of independent Hamiltonians for each k, and each of them involves only two states, so this is reduces to the two by two uh, landau Zina problem. So, I mean, not to say that it's not interesting, you can calculate you know, some interesting uh, stuff with it, but from the point of view of the multi-level landau Zina problem, it's, uh, it's trivial. And there are many more, uh, 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 reducible multi-level Landau Zina problems like that. But since uh, you know the original work of uh, Landau Zina Moirana and Stuckelberg in 1932, only three irreducible multi-level Landau Zina problems have been identified. So now I'm going to list them. So the first one is uh, uh, demkov osharov model. So what you see here is a plot of diabatic states. This is a diagonal, a plot of diagonal part of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so what you see is that there are many levels that have the same slope, you know, set to zero here, and one level, one time-dependent level that crosses them all. So this level interacts with each of the other levels with uh, interaction, what is called interaction uh, GK, while the other levels do not directly interact with each other. So the second case is a so-called bow tie model because the diabetic uh, energy diagram resembles a bow tie. So here uh, you have uh, all levels have different slopes. They all cross in one point. And again, uh, only this privileged level uh, with zero slope here interacts with all of them while they do not directly interact with each other. And the third example, which I will show that is integrable in this talk, is uh, uh, this models that we had. And I think I forgot to mention on that, fly, uh, on that slide on uh, bcs BEC condensate that in quantum optics, this model uh, you know, has appeared and is known as inhomogeneous uh, decay model. Okay, so the third case is inhomogeneous decay model. So here is, for example, the solution of the demkov osharov uh, model, uh, the simplest case. So you see the scattering matrix here written in terms of P and Q, which are uh, you know, elementary functions of these interactions, GK and uh, lambdas. And one feature of the scattering matrix is that it factorizes uh, into product of scattering matrices, each of them uh, corresponding to a two by two scattering uh, of level one with two, one with three, etc. That's a general feature of most uh, solvable uh, multi-level Landau Zina problems. Okay, so what is special about these models? What sets them apart from any other Hamiltonian linear in time? So, you know, uh, the first thing that uh, my student, Aniket Patra, found uh, was that the demkov osharov and Bowtie model have uh, non-trivial commuting partners of uh, this form, linear plus inversely proportional to uh, time. 
you know, that commute with uh, Demko Washer and, and both high Hamiltonians at all t. Now, the uh, DK in homogeneous DK model is a known integrable model, so we know its commuting partners already. And let me know that if you take a generic uh, linear matrix, like if you randomly generate A and B, it's not going to have any commuting partners uh, of this form except uh, a combination, linear combination of itself and identity. Um, so, for example, here are the commuting partners for the inhomogeneous DK model. So it is convenient to rewrite uh, this model in terms of uh, Anderson uh, pseudospins, spin one half, which is an identical rewrite. So in this case, spin lowering and raising operators are pair uh, creation annihilation operators, and the Z component is related to the occupation number. Then the DK model uh, takes this form of a spin boson Hamiltonian. So it's a bunch of spins in an inhomogeneous uh, field along Z axis. Uh, the, the boson and the spin boson interaction. And here I already took the model with uh, time dependence, omega naught is minus nu t. So the commuting partners are kind of uh, central spin Hamiltonians where you have this privileged spin uh, SK which interacts with all other spins and with boson. So these guys commute uh, among themselves and with a the DK Hamiltonian. And you know, writing that omega naught is minus nu t of course doesn't spoil this commutation relation. So it also has this non-trivial uh, commuting partners. Okay, fine, I mean there are all these commuting partners but what's the point? I mean, what is uh, their role? How do they help us to solve for the dynamic of the system? As we discussed, they're not even conserved, right? So in this case, dhk dt, for example, is this expression that is non-zero. So what's the point? And here comes uh, the main idea. So it turns out that this hk determine the evolution of the state of the system with respect to uh, parameters xk which are parameters of the problem other than time. I mean, time you can also regard as one of the parameters, but you have other parameters as well, like matrix elements of A and B. And it turns out that while the Hamiltonian determines the evolution in time, these guys determine the evolution with respect to uh, other system parameters. In other words, the non-stationary Schrodinger equation can be consistently embedded into a system of multi-time Schrodinger equations like this. Okay, so uh, at this point, let me, you know, uh, make notation more uniform. So new t I'll call x naught and h I will call h naught and the derivative with respect to xk as dk. And then this system, you know, compactly uh, rewrites like this. And now if I take the derivative of this with respect to xj, and then take the derivative of J's equation with respect to XK and equate the mixed derivatives, I get a consistency condition like this. And in most cases that uh, we are interested in, Hamiltonian is real, meaning in appropriate basis, uh, matrix, Hamiltonian, uh, matrix elements are real. Then this part is real, while this part is purely imaginary, so the condition separates into two uh, conditions. One is this condition which I call cross-derivative condition, and the other is a commutation condition that uh, you know, signals integrability of the underlying model. Um, so for example, let's check this for the uh, uh, DK Hamiltonian. So we have these integrals. We know already that they commute. Now let's uh, check the cross-derivative condition. Let's take HK and differentiate with respect to epsilon P and only this term contributes because epsilon p is not equal to epsilon k, and so I have, I, I get this uh, expression, and it's uh, symmetric in uh, k and p. So it's equal also to dhp to d epsilon k. So you see that this condition is uh, satisfied, and also for x naught, uh, which is minus omega naught, I have to check it, and indeed the derivative of the k Hamiltonian with respect to epsilon k is skz, and the derivative of this guy with respect to minus omega naught is a SK, SKZ. Now notice that if I take any other, so here, uh, any other time dependence, uh, this will not work. So here, uh, omega, uh, you know, omega naught is basically rescaled time. If I take T squared, then in this derivative, 
dhk dt, I'll get a t-dependent uh, t coefficient in front of skz, and it's not going to be equal to that. So only uh, linear uh, time dependence of omega naught will work. Uh, okay, so we have this uh, multi-time Schrodinger system. How does it help us to uh, solve the problem? So you can write a formal solution uh, you know, in this uh, multi-dimension real parameter space as an ordered exponential of this form. Uh, and the consistency condition means that a non-abelian uh, gauge field with components minus i h k has zero curvature, which means that this uh, exponent is path independent. I mean, it better be so that uh, this system have a unique solution for any initial condition. Which means that uh, what we can do is we can deform the path uh, you know, to our convenience. So here is, for example, the uh, solution of the Yemkov osharov model with this method. So uh, in, in this problem, we need to determine uh, the evolution from minus infinity to plus infinity along the real line, okay? And it's uh, relatively easy when the time is large, but with, when we approach the origin at finite time, we have multiple non-adiabatic transitions, so it's uh, difficult to handle it. But now, what we can do, you know, having this enlarged space and the freedom to deform the path, we can for, uh, first evolve along this uh, ace. And, you know, ace is a diagonal part of uh, this matrix A, and in this case, they're equal to uh, xk. So, uh, and, we, and if we do that, evolve along some ray, like at minus infinity uh, in ace, we can achieve a situation when all a's are well separated. It, uh, so, which means that all levels are infinitely separated from each other, which means that the evolution is going to be adiabatic uh, unless there is a degeneracy. And the degeneracy only occurs when this uh, time-dependent level crosses level uh, two, level three, etc., which also implies that the scattering matrix is uh, going to factorize like uh, this. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, about this from a different angle. So there is a famous multi-time Schrodinger, uh, system of Schrodinger equations called knizhnik zamolodchikov equations. So they have this uh, form where Hj are uh, central spin Hamiltonians like that, known as Godin magnets. And so the question is if there is any relationship between the multi-time Schrodinger equations we derived uh, and uh, knizhnik zamolodchikov equations. You know, it's natural to ask this que question because, for example, the DK model, in homogeneous DK model, is known to be related to Godin uh, magnets. So for our purposes, we want to generalize this kinetic zamological equation uh, by adding a magnetic field on the central spin, like this. Now, the advantage is that in this formulation, it's related to the BCS model. Indeed, if I take linear combination of this uh, Godin magnet, up to a constant, I'm getting a spin Hamiltonian like this with infinite uh, range interaction and uh, in homogeneous magnetic field along the z-axis. And this is nothing but the BCS model that I showed you earlier in Anderson to the spin uh, uh, representation where G is identified with one over two B. And this uh, uh, kind of generalization of kinetic zamolodchik of equation has been, uh, you know, considered by uh, uh, you know, various people, including our chairman. So, um, however, one thing that apparently was not uh, noticed was that we introduced this uh, new parameter B. So the state of the system now depends on an additional parameter uh, B. So uh, we can ask, how does it depend on B? And it turns out that the evolution of the state of the system with B is governed by nothing else but the BCS Hamiltonian. And you can indeed check that this equation is consistent with the rest of the equations by checking the cross-derivative condition. Yeah, dHBCS d epsilon k is going to be uh, 
uh, two SKZ, and which is the same as uh, DHK uh, uh, DB, right? Which is also two, uh, you know, SKZ. Okay, which means that this system of equations is consistent. So we have this enlarged now system of equations, which I call KZBCS equations, and this immediately gives me. Uh, uh, a solution of non-stationary Schrodinger equation for the BCS problem because now I can make this B a function of time. So in particular, if I take B equal to new T, I'll get this BCS Hamiltonian with coupling that goes as one over T, which I already advertised. And if I take it uh, some periodic function of time, I'll get some integrable Floquet uh, BCS Hamiltonian. And the solution uh, you know, by construction, the solution of the Schrodinger equation is just going to be the knizhik zamolochikov wave function where I, uh, you know, make B a function of time. So, um, now what about, uh, uh, you know, this exactly solvable multi-level Landau's inner problems? I mean, what, what about them? Well, it turns out that there is a mapping from Godin magnets to all of them. So, uh, in the case of the DK model, this uh, mapping was noted already by Godin. So, if you take one of these pins and uh, send it, uh, you know, write it uh, in terms of Holstein Primakov uh, bosons and uh, send the magnitude of the spin to infinity, you'll get the uh, DK model from one of this HG, let's say H1, while the rest are going to be its commuting partners. And similarly, you can show that you can. Uh, uh, the, the, the Demko Vosherov and the bow tie model also map to uh, Godin uh, magnets. So, for example, here is the mapping for the Demko Vosherov model. So, uh, all this central spin Hamiltonians conserve the total uh, Z component of the spin, which means that in the basis where S total Z is diagonal, they break up into, uh, uh, you know, into, uh, they, they have block diagonal form. So the block that corresponds to all spins, let's say, up, and by the way, the magnitude of the spin here can be arbitrary, not necessarily one half. So all spins polarized uh, up, uh, that's just one state, that's one, one, uh, one by one block, and the next block, uh, one spin flip block is n by n, if there are n spins, and this, is, and this block exactly corresponds to Jim Cobb Osherov model, so here is the mapping, and the mapping is rather you know, involved, it involves in particular the magnitude of spin, which is just some parameter in this block. And so then the n by n block of H1 maps to the dimkov osherov Hamiltonian, while uh, uh, n by n blocks of the rest of Hj map to commuting partners of the dimkov osherov And similarly uh, for the bow tie. Now, the only thing that this mapping ensures is uh, that you get commuting partners. The second condition is uh, unrelated to the mapping. And, and it is some mystery and you know, fortunate uh, choice of parameters and luck that the second condition also holds. And only the second condition, uh, you know, together with the first, guarantees the uh, integrability of the resulting model. And there is no general way, or at least I don't know of any general way of, uh, you know, coming up with a mapping that is going to also preserve this uh, cross-derivative uh, condition. So, okay, yeah, I'm almost done. So here is, uh, uh, you know, uh, like some uh, off-shell better on that solution for the Knizhik uh, Zamolochikov equations, and then you know, as I said, if you make this B here a uh, function of time, you'll get the solution of the, for the BCS, uh, time-dependent BCS Hamiltonians. Uh, um, and uh, you can, uh, I mean, use a similar technique of shell Betanzas to solve all other problems. Uh, so here is a solution for the Jemko washer which is particular, particularly simple. But let me not, uh, you know, dwell on that further and let me show you some physical uh, result instead. So, uh, so again, so, so, so let's take this BCS Hamiltonian and uh, let's uh, start in the ground state at t, uh, uh, you know, equal to zero plus. So this is an infinite uh, ferromagnetic interaction between these spins, which corresponds to an infinite attraction between fermions. 
So the ground state is just uh, uh, you know a lowest eigenvalue eigenstate of this uh, uh, of this term, which is basically like s squared. So uh, you know in the BCS problem, all spins are one half, and it's natural to work in the sector where the total z projection is zero. That's what you have when you have particle hole uh, symmetry, for example. So um, so the you know for s squared the uh, the maximum value of S is achieved in a symmetric uh, combination of all the spins. So this is then the ground state, okay? And now we, uh, you know, turn the interaction off. The coupling goes to zero as one over new T. And the question is, what is the spin distribution at uh, T going to plus infinity? And by the way, the spin distribution, you know, translates into the fermion distribution easily because uh, S um, J Z is equal to N J minus one over two. Okay. So now this distribution uh, was uh, found uh, not by me, but but uh, my but by my collaborators on an earlier work, and so here is uh, the answer. You know, it's uh, some rather simple answer. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing to note is that uh, if all levels are equally spaced, epsilon j is equal to j delta, then this is a thermal distribution with a temperature that is the rate times the level spacing divided by 2 pi. But for any other uh, distribution of epsilon j, which is arbitrary in principle, this is not a thermal distribution. So. You know, an interesting question here is um, how to explain the failure to uh, thermalize. Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, normally it is explained by some conservation laws. And here we have no conservation laws because of explicit time dependence. And in particular, you can also turn off the interaction using some non-integrable time dependence and an interesting question is whether it will thermalize in that case. Okay, so uh, let me uh, conclude here. Okay, so yeah, I guess I don't even you know, want to uh, read uh, uh, this uh, summary. Um, so let me acknowledge my uh, collaborators, my student Aniket Patra, uh, Nikolai Sinitsen from Los Alamos, Vladimir Cherniak, and also uh, Chen San, who is a, a student of uh, Pakrovsky, you know, who did some work on one of the uh, papers. And so these are the papers on which the talk was uh, based. And let me also, you know, acknowledge one other important collaborator, which is Pierce. You see, the thing is that my office and Pierce's office are adjacent. And the walls are very thin. And Pierce, if you know him, speaks very loudly, right? So effectively, we collaborate on all projects, <laughs> right? So I always have to acknowledge <laughs> him. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.